See, Mark knows me really well, and I was going to tell you a secret about me. I laid this up here because Mark said, who's the song leader? And I'm going to tell the song leader to do this because he knew I would forget. And so I put this up here so that if, if the song leader, because I wasn't sure who was leading singing, didn't have a chance to say it, that I would for sure say it because Mark knows about me that if he says, hey, Wes, before your class or, hey, Wes, after your class, would you announce this? And I always say, sure, Mark, I'll do that. And I always forget. So he asked Eric because he knew I would forget. So. Let's, let's pray. Father God, we do praise you. You are magnificent. And Father, we love to praise you. And we love to gather together with your people and to exalt your name and to think about the epic story in which we are grafted in. Father, we are so thankful to Jesus and for the adoption and the life that we have in him. Father, as we continue to explore uh, this magnificent letter that uh, the Apostle Paul wrote, inspired, carried along by your spirit, we pray, Father, that this letter draws us closer to you, closer to Jesus, and, Father, closer to one another. Father, we pray that you bless our time together, that you are glorified in our study. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I hope that you've enjoyed uh, our Roman study. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, and I hope that, if nothing else, what we've gained from the last several months of studying this book is that the book of Romans, and indeed the gospel itself, is so much more than how do I get saved, right? It's so much more than that. Yes, it does have to do with the forgiveness of my sins, the forgiveness of your sins, uh, how to be justified in, in God's sight, right in God's sight, in a right covenant relationship with him. Yes, 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 it's that, but it's so much more than that, isn't it? It's how this creator God is a keeper of promises and how he picked this people, Israel, not only to be his special people, but through whom the blessings and the promises that he's made would flow out to all of the Gentile people and that he was going to redeem and make a part of his family forever, people of every nation. And, and Paul is laying all of that out. And then helping us to see, helping you to see, helping me to see, helping the, the people in the church in Rome in the first century to see how do I fit into that story. And if I accept this, and if I believe this, and if I've been transformed by this, what does my life look like now in the Messiah? What does life in the Messiah Jesus, life in submission to the Messiah Jesus, what does that life look like? And, and that's far more than we can really even explore an hour a week or two or three hours a week. I really hope, I really hope that that's something that we ponder, that we meditate. The, the psalmist says to meditate on the word of God, right? And so do we do that? Do we meditate on that? What should my life look like if it's really being transformed by being in a covenant relationship with God through the King Jesus, through the Messiah Jesus, what should my life look like? Not just what are all the rules, all the thou shalts and all the thou shalt nots, but what does a transformed life look like? Here, let's, let's summarize. You know I'm going to summarize again, even though we're getting close to the end of the book. Romans 1 through 8, in keeping with his promises, God is rescuing creation. The whole thing, it's, it's cosmic. He is rescuing creation from the reign of sin and death by adopting, justifying, and giving his spirit to all those who have faith in Jesus with the promise that the creation or that our mortal bodies along with the whole creation will be redeemed when his wrath is revealed against sin. And then we said in chapters 9 through 11 that God was being fair and consistent in choosing to cut off a portion of ethnic Israel for their unbelief so he could bestow his covenant riches on a full and complete family made up of a remnant of ethnic Israel along with the Gentiles of every nation, everyone who submits in faith to the lordship of Jesus. And then chapters 12 through 14, I combine chapters 12 and 13 with what we talked about last week, chapter 14, the only reasonable or logical or spiritual response to God's mercy is to offer your body to God 
as a living sacrifice, like a priest offers a sacrifice. And this is what it looks like, by doing good and not evil, pursuing peace and edification, loving the church, loving neighbors, loving enemies, being subject to governing authorities, and welcoming each other regardless of differing opinions. I mean, man, that, that, that's what he's laid out in 12, 13, and 14. And think about that list of things. Do good and not evil. Pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding or edification. Love the church. Love your neighbors. Love your enemies. Be subject to the governing authorities. Welcome each other and not to quarrel over your dialogismos we talked about last week, your opinions, the things you've reasoned out in your head about what you think you should do or shouldn't do, and, and welcome each other regardless of your differing opinions. What would your life really look like if those things defined your life? That, that's what it is to offer your body as a living sacrifice to God. Again, it's really easy for us to just talk about that in an abstract way. You know, I've, I've heard preachers even, you think Christians debate stuff back and forth. I mean, you should hear preachers sometimes. You go back and forth about what, like, what's worship and Romans 12 says our whole life is worship. And well, what does that mean? And what does that look like? Well, Paul tells us what that looks like. Yes, absolutely. Your entire life is service to God. It is divine priestly service. It's like a priest offering a sacrifice to God. But what does that look like? That's what it looks like. Loving the church loving your neighbor, loving your enemy, pursuing what makes for peace and edification, welcoming each other regardless of the differing opinions because God is assembling, he's collecting, he's gathering a family to himself, he's adopting and justifying and giving his spirit to all those who have faith in King Jesus. So if you have pledged your loyalty to Jesus, if you've been delivered out of the reign of sin and death, in baptism, you've been united with Jesus and raised up to walk in this new life. You confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then we're family, right? And if we're family, this is what, this is what family life should look like. And he really continues that same theme in, in the beginning of chapter 15. In fact, there really is very little transition from the end of chapter 14 to the chap beginning of chapter 15. He started in the beginning of 14, if you remember, about welcoming each other. And that same thought continues here. So chapter 15, verse 1. We who are strong, and remember when he's talking about stre strength and weakness, that it's in relation to faith. And in there it means something like confidence to act in a certain way, right? So there's some people that are strong in faith that have the confidence to act in a certain way and that say, I can eat that. I can eat whatever. It doesn't matter what I eat. And there are other people who are weak in their faith who say, no, I, I can't eat that. that. That would be wrong. Or I have to, you know, keep these special days or whatever. And he says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Look at that. Please for his good to build him up. If you are what, you have an obligation to do those things. If you are strong, right? See, worldly strength exercises itself on behalf of itself, right? Worldly strength exercises itself on behalf of itself. If a, if a worldly person is strong, then he uses his strength for his own good, for his own benefit, to build himself up, to build his own power, to build his own base, to build his own pleasure, whatever it is. But Jesus teaches us that godly strength is leveraged on behalf of the weak. That the worldly strength is leveraged on behalf of oneself, and godly strength is leveraged on behalf of those who are weak. So he says, listen, if you have been transformed by Jesus, then you have an obligation. If you are really strong, then you have an obligation to bear with those who are weak. And what does that look like? It means that you work for his good, to please him, to build him up. Just whatever you would do. Jesus says the same thing, doesn't he? He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Whatever you would do for yourself, 
Whatever you would use your own strength, however you would leverage your own strength for your own benefit, you have an obligation to leverage your strength for the benefit of other people, especially those who are weak. But that's not the natural tendency, is it? That's not the natural way of living our life. That's not the worldly way of living our life. The natural way to do it is if you're strong, then you, you do whatever you want to do, right? I, I don't have to listen to you. I don't have to be held back by you. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm strong enough to eat this, so I'm going to eat it. I'm strong enough to celebrate this day or not celebrate this day or do whatever I want to, so I don't have to listen to you or I don't have to put up with you. And Paul says that's exactly what you have to do. Bear with the failings of the weak. That's the only way this new humanity, this new people, this new community, this new family is going to work. Not for the weak to help the weak, but for the strong to help the weak, for those who are strong to leverage their strength on behalf of the weak. Now look at verse 3. Now he gives us the reason why. For, here's, here's why. Here's why you do that. For Christ did not please himself. And notice he says Christ, not just Jesus, but Christ, right? He doesn't say for Jesus did not please himself. He says for the Christ, for the Messiah did not please himself. The King did not please himself. But As it's written, and then he quotes from Psalm 69, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. And Paul's going to quote a ton of scripture, a ton of the Hebrew scripture, the Old Testament, in these next few verses. And he's not just pulling things randomly out of context because it sounds good or it supports his his thought. He's doing it because he's saying this is the entirety of scripture. That this is the way godly people, this is the way a godly king, this is the way the Messiah was going to operate. That he would be, and Psalm 69, go read it. It describes this this king. It describes the Messiah as being someone who has a zeal for the house of God and a zeal to do the will of God and people hate him for it. And the reproaches of those who reproach God fall on him. And he meekly endures it and puts up with it and allows all of that garbage to be put on him and then God God glorifies him. God lifts him up. And that's exactly who the Messiah was always meant to be. And that's exactly the role that Jesus played. Christ did not please himself. He didn't leverage his own strength for his own benefit. Ever. He took his strength and he used it. He exercised it for the benefit of the weak. Verse 4. And he's specifically talking about Psalm 69. For whatever was written like Psalm 69, whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. I mean, what does that mean exactly? Does that mean the Old Testament tells us that, that Jesus would come and sort of what sort of Messiah he was going to be? Sure, absolutely. But, but it also says, he's saying, this is how you should live your life. Because this is how Jesus lived his life. Not just Jesus, but this is how the king lived his life. This is what it looks like to follow in the steps of the Messiah. Is that you don't use your strength for your own benefit, but for the benefit of the the weak. Because that's what the Messiah did. And, And the Messiah was living out Psalm 69. And in the end, he was glorified. In the end, God took care of him. In the end, God kept his promises to him. And that's why the scriptures are an encouragement to you and give you hope because God is a God who keeps his promises. Because what's our fear? Our fear is if I'm strong and I use my strength for the benefit of my weaker brothers and sisters, if I exercise and leverage my strength for the benefit of other people, who's going to look out for me? Who's going to take care of me? I'm going to be taken advantage of. I'm going to be run all over. And and it's just not going to work out for me. And aren't we thankful that's not how Jesus thought? Because Jesus was willing to give himself on behalf of others and God took care of him. He entrusted himself to the one who judges justly, as Peter would say. Psalm 69 says this at the very end. It says, the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners, 
Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build up the cities of Judah and people shall dwell there and possess it. The offspring of his servants shall inherit it and those who love his name shall dwell in it. God takes care of the people who trust in his promises. That's exactly what he did for the Messiah in raising Jesus from the dead. The one who did not please himself, but rather allowed the reproaches of those who reproached God to fall on him, God delivered him. So Paul says, this is the sort of encouragement that we should draw from the scriptures so that we might have what? Hope. Hope. That's what biblical hope is all about. Everything we've been saying, God keeps his promises. And, that, and that's what the scriptures tell us. As you, as you read through the Old Testament, there's so much of it that people are just frustrated. Do you see it? When you read through the Old Testament, I mean, read through Ezra and Nehemiah. And you know how I like to, to challenge us to sit down and just read it in one sitting. Go and read Ezra or Nehemiah. And you might think, well, those are like really super positive books, right? You know, they come back from captivity and they rebuild stuff. Read to the end. And both Ezra and Nehemiah, you know what they pray? God, we're slaves. You said we were going to come back from exile and captivity. And yeah, kind of, we did. But we're still under the thumb of Persia. And people still aren't obeying. And I mean, they're ripping their beard out and their hair out. And they're beating each other. I mean, it's it's rough. Because they're like, when when are all of your promises ever going to come true? And what Paul has been saying since day one in this book the gospel message that Paul and all the apostles were preaching is that God's promises are coming true in Jesus. And so we read through these scriptures and we know, we know more than anyone ever has or anyone ever could have before Jesus that God is a keeper of promises and he always takes care of and delivers and will raise up those who put their trust in him. This is our hope that is founded in the gospel. Verse 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. You see? This, This is what it looks like to live in accord with the Messiah Jesus. Is to live in harmony with each other. And the only way to live in in harmony with each other is that God grants us endurance and encouragement. And when God grants us endurance and encouragement, we can live with each other in harmony. And when we live in harmony with each other, we're in accord with the Messiah Jesus. That together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, see he hasn't changed his whole theme of what he's been talking about since the beginning of chapter 14. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. This is what it looks like to live in accord with the Messiah Jesus. Verse 8, kind of have to go fast. So we can get through it all. Verse 8. For I tell you that Christ, has, Christ became a servant. <laughs> Even that statement, right? I mean, we sort of, we've, we've read this stuff so much that sometimes we don't let it sink in. And think about what a counterintuitive statement that is. I tell you that the Messiah became a servant. I tell you that God's anointed king, that the ruler... The the creator, the the one in whom is all the fullness of God dwelling bodily, he became a servant. To whom? To, To his people, to the circumcised, to the Jewish people. Why? To show God's what? Truthfulness. God keeps his promises in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. Right? God has kept his promises to Israel. He is the hope of Israel realized. He is the hope of the Jewish people realized. And, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. That's what God is doing in Jesus. Is bringing in the remnant of Israel. All the faithful of Israel. And, and 
the Gentile people, all the people of all the nations, you and me and everyone who will submit to the lordship of Jesus. And then he, he gives it. You see, I kind of tried to highlight it in red. Yeah, it shows up better there. As it's written, and then again it is said, and again and again. And so he quotes verse after verse after verse. 2 Samuel 22, Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 117, Isaiah 11. And he quotes all of these verses. And again, Paul doesn't just pull stuff out of context. What he's saying is this is exactly what Moses and the prophets and the writings The law and the prophets and the writings. This is what the whole of our scriptures told us that God was going to accomplish. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. So his, again, as we've said every week, his whole purpose is to bring Jewish believers, those who are ethnically Jewish, and those who are ethnically Gentile, and bring them into one family. Because Paul says, this, this is what it looks like to live in accord with the, with the gospel message, with Christ Jesus, is that all of us come into one family. This is what all of the scriptures have been pointing to. Not just that the Messiah would come to bless Israel, but that through Israel, God would bless all the nations of mankind. You see, this is what you're a part of. This is what you're a part of. And when we simply reduce Christianity to just how do I go to heaven when I die? How do I get saved? And we reduce Christianity to just this personal, individual type of thing, my own spiritual walk, my own, spiritual, my own personal relationship with God, and we reduce it to that, we really miss a big part of it. Yes, it's personal. And yes, it has to be your decision to put your faith in King Jesus. But it's epic, it's cosmic, it's worldwide. It's about God bringing together a whole people. And it's about us in this room and as widely as possible, us learning to live in harmony with each other. And if we don't do that, And we just say, hey, I'm just going to worry about me. You worry about you. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm strong. I can do whatever I want. You just, you have your scruples. I've got mine. You just go over there. You do your own thing. Hang out with people that look like you and think like you and talk like you. And I'm going to do the same. We miss it. And Paul would say about Peter, when Peter was doing that kind of nonsense, he says, listen, that's not in step with the truth of the gospel. If the gospel doesn't bring us together, If the gospel doesn't make it so that the strong bear with the weak and we live in harmony with each other and we love each other and our life isn't full of love and joy and peace and patience, kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control, if that's not what it looks like, then we're really not living out the gospel. This is what it looks like. Chapter or verse 13. May the God of hope, right? The God of hope. Why is God the God of hope? Because God keeps his... Promises, right? All of the things that we're expecting God to do and deliver on, God will deliver them. God is, God has, God is, God will keep his promises. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And do we realize how hope transforms us and how hope changes our life? You know how many bad decisions we make because we're, ashamed or guilty or especially afraid? How many bad decisions? How many times do we treat people poorly because we are afraid? And Paul is telling us that through endurance, through bearing with each other, putting up with each other, and through the encouragement of the scriptures, through the spirit who lives within us, that God will fill us with hope and joy and peace in our believing, and that when that happens, we we abound in hope. And it changes everything. It changes how we live our life. It changes how we treat the strangers. It changes how we think. It changes how we pray. It changes how we treat each other. 
He says, I myself, I'm satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to instruct one another. But on some points, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God. In other words, God gave me a gift. And Paul doesn't just mean salvation. He means his ministry, right? God gave Paul the ministry to the Gentiles, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God. I like that, don't you? I mean, Paul would say, Romans 12, that we're all priests, right? We're all offering to God a sacrifice. This, in Paul's preaching, proclaiming the gospel message, this is his priestly service, so that the offering of the Gentiles, that's how Paul is picturing it in his mind, that he's taking the Gentile people And taking them as a sacrifice to God. Offering of the Gentiles that they may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. This is the gift that God gave him to be part of that. Verse 17. In Christ Jesus then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. To bring the Gentiles to obedience. I'm not going to boast in anything except whatever it is that Jesus has accomplished in me. And this is what Jesus is accomplishing in me in bringing you, the Gentile people, to God as a sacrifice. To bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way to Elycrium, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel. Not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. So, in other words, I don't want to just keep preaching to everybody that's heard, but I want to keep expanding the borders of the kingdom of God further and further and further. In this case, he's talking about Spain. He says, but as it's written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. And again, he's not just quoting stuff out of context. He's quoting from Isaiah 52. And and again, you know Isaiah 53, right? The suffering servant. And we talk about how that applies to the Messiah. But in context, verse 13 of Isaiah 52, behold my servant, the one who will go for God and do the will of God in doing what? Suffering in order to bring the Gentiles to God. My servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Again, Paul is saying this has always been God's plan, and it's always been part of what he's laid out in all of the scriptures, and I'm getting to be a part of it. He's allowed me to be a part of it. And I can't wait to go and tell other people about the servant who has suffered on their behalf to bring them to God and to bring this whole new groups of people to God as an offering, like a priest bringing an offering to God. Now, just stop for just a second because I think we need to, you know, figure out how we plug into this. I mean, do we realize that we're a part of that as well? I mean, we may not have been given, obviously, none of us have been given an apostolic ministry, but, but you get to play a part of this as well. Mark talked about on Sunday and did a marvelous job talking about the Great Commission. That was specifically a commission that he gave to the apostles, but that all of us are continuing to take up that baton generation after generation after generation to go and tell the world. And Paul considered that the grace of God. That's a grace. Not just your salvation is God's grace. The fact that you get to be a part of telling your husband or your wife or your kids or your neighbors or your parents or your coworkers about Jesus. That is your gift that you get to be a part of this epic story that's been unfolding since the very beginning of time. It's been unfolding and now here you are plugged into that story and you've become a part of that story. The question is, will we take up that charge and do what we're called to do? Verse 22, this is the reason why I've so often been hindered from coming to you because of all the ministry that he's doing. But now since I no longer 
have any room for work in these regions. And since I've longed for many years to come to you, so Paul's not been to Rome yet. And he says, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I've enjoyed your company for a while. But at present, this is verse 25, at present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. So now we've kind of got a little bit of context of what part of Paul's story this plays into. You remember when Paul traveled all around Asia and Macedonia collecting money to take it to Jerusalem for the poor there? And so Paul is on his way to take those funds to Jerusalem. Now we know something that Paul didn't know when he's writing this, right? What's going to happen to him in Jerusalem? He's going to be arrested, isn't he? He, and eventually, he's going to end up in Rome, but not exactly how he was planning on ending up in Rome. He's going to end up in Rome as a, as a prisoner. But he's going to get to come to Rome, and he's going to get to stay quite a while in a house because he's under house arrest. But he's going to get to preach the gospel to all kinds of people. And Paul, even though his plans got messed up all of the time, and he got beaten and shipwrecked and arrested and all kinds of things, is, did he regret that? No. In all of these things, he would say, I'm more than a conqueror. I, I'm victorious. I, I, this is still part of God's grace, even that I should share in the sufferings of the Messiah. Because I'm a part of this. And, and here's the thing. So are you. Yeah. Whatever it is that we might have to suffer, whatever it is we might have to give up, it probably won't be anything like Paul's. But Paul considered it part of God's gift to him that he would be allowed to suffer for Jesus. In a way, he would look at it like he was carrying on the suffering of Jesus. He was, just like he said a minute ago, he was following in the footsteps of the Messiah by suffering and allowing the reproaches of those who reproached God to fall on him. And That's how we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. We allow those who reproach God, their reproaches to fall on us. And we share in his sufferings take up our cross and follow him for Macedonia and Acacia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem so those in Greece and in Macedonia have contributed money and Paul is taking that to Jerusalem but look at what he says verse 27 for they were pleased to do it and indeed they owe it to them for if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. You see what he's saying? He's saying this, this, this message and this salvation and this adoption, it's Jewish, right? I mean, it's from Jerusalem. It's from Israel. And, and this Jerusalem church was where all of this began. And then the message spread from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, and now it's spreading to the edge of the world. And all of these people that have been now adopted into this family of Israel, they, they sort, sort of owe their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem from which all of these spiritual blessings began to pour forth. Look at verse 28. When therefore I've completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I'll leave for Spain by way of you. So... His plan was, as soon as I get to Jerusalem, I'm going to give them the money, and then I'm going to come to Rome, and then I'm going to go on to Jerusalem. And I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Verse 30, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the love of the Spirit, to, here's such an important phrase, strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Strive together with me in your prayers. Paul is, amongst other things, a missionary. And he, he sees himself in partnership, not, not necessarily financial partnership, but spiritual partnership with all of these churches. And he, he says, listen, when, when you're praying for me, you're striving together with me. How, how often do we think of it that way? That when you pray for our mission efforts, when you pray for the efforts of this congregation, when you pray for elders and deacons and missionaries and preachers, you are a part of the work that they are doing. 
you're striving together with them. We are all in this together. And as we help each other and contribute and pray together, actual things change because of the way that we we pray. Paul believed that he was doing battle with the spiritual forces of darkness in the world. And he believed that when Christians were praying for his efforts, that they were striving, they were working and fighting together side by side with him against the spiritual forces of darkness in the world. Do we understand that? Or again, do our prayers reflect the fact that we simply think Christianity is just about me and God, and maybe a few other people that are around me. We are a part of something worldwide. And Rome is a long way from Jerusalem. But Paul would say, as I'm out here doing all of this work, and you're praying for me, you're participating with me. You're striving together with me. We're a long way from Nicaragua. We're a long way from South Texas and northern Mexico. We're a long way from Estonia. We're a long way from Haiti. We're a long way from those places. But you, as you contribute to those goods financially, but also as you pray for them, you are striving together with them. You are a part of mission work. As you open your mouth and tell other people about Jesus, and as you lift up your prayers, you are a part of the work that's going on all over the world that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. You would think he was done, but there's another chapter, so next week we'll pick up there. But let's, let's go to God in prayer. Most Holy Father, the God of peace, the God of hope, the God of all comforts. You comfort us in all of our affliction so that we may comfort others as they're afflicted. Father, we know that we are a part of the work that's going on in the world. Even if we're just a small part of the work that's going on in the world. Father, we pray for our missionaries. We pray for all those that are preaching, proclaiming the good news about Jesus in the dark places of the world that are dealing with persecution and heartache and financial hardships. And Father, we pray that you open doors of opportunity for them. We pray, Father, that you bring them to our thoughts and to our memories, to our hearts and to our minds constantly, that we will remember that our brothers throughout the world are suffering and are struggling and are doing everything within their power to share with their communities about Jesus. And may we join with them, not only financially and in prayer, but also in sharing the good news in this community. Thank you, Father, that we get to be a part of shining the light in Collin County. And Father, may we tell even more people the good news about Jesus so they will know that you are a keeper of promises and that all of the promises you've made are coming true in Jesus Christ. Father, may you grant us encouragement and joy, and peace, and hope through and in your spirit. And Father, it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, church.